Hello everyone and welcome to another Everton show. It's been quite a week, hasn't it? New investment, yet another away win and the prospect of one of the form teams of the Premier League coming to Goodison Park at the weekend to dissect the busy period for the club. It's a pleasure to welcome the Diamond, Graeme Stewart. Good evening. There's a feel-good factor about Everton Football Club, as I say, Graeme, on and off the pitch at the moment. Well, there is. First and foremost, uh, welcome to Mr Farhad Mashiri, mm -hmm. um, our new club investor, taking 49.9% of the, of the shares. And, you know, that's been a, a long-running saga. We've had all kinds of rumours doing the rounds from various different countries, different personnel. But uh, the chairman, Bill Kemright, has come up trumps again and made sure that uh, we have our investor in the making. The future's very bright for the Toffees, isn't it? We'll get a lot more insight and opinion from Graeme Stewart in this week's show. And as always, we've got plenty more besides. It's a new beginning. Uh, every Evertonian should be extremely excited about the future and realise that we've been... Um, is, is, a, is a fantastic uh, opportunity to welcome Fahad Moshiri to, to Everton. I think the, the team offensively and defensively did a great job. We know we have uh, possession of the game and, and uh, I think uh, it was a great game. Yeah, I'm really happy that I signed a five years contract with a club uh, like Everton. So, I mean, it's now after one and a half season, it makes me proud that Everton gave me a new contract. Well, as I alluded to at the top of the programme, it has been a pretty momentous week in the history of Everton Football Club. The chairman, Bill Kenwright, has been working extremely hard to find the right man to come in and work alongside him. And in Farhad Mashiri, he's done just that. And the excitement of the supporters, by the way, just now is most certainly shared by the manager. Well, it is uh, it's, it's one of those moments that they can become uh, very significant for the future of our football club. Uh, it's a real excitement around, around Finch Farm and everyone. To, uh, connected to, to our football club. Obviously, I met um, uh, Mr. Moshiri and he's a very impressive character with a, a real a winning mentality, as you could imagine, for, from uh, the success that he had as a businessman. But I think there's the added value of understanding the Premier League. He's been involved with another Premier League club for a long time, so understands how difficult is that um, transition between having a very strong vision of where we want to get as a football club and, and actually doing it. But has become really attached to Everton. I think the introduction that our chairman gave him over the months in, in trying to get to know our team and get to know our football club and get to know what, what moves our fans and what stimulates our fans has been, it's been quite a, a, an impressive journey. And I just feel that is a perfect profile that we, we needed in order to take us into a new level. It's a new beginning. Uh, every Evertonian should be extremely excited about the future and realise that we've been um, is is a is a fantastic uh, opportunity to welcome Fahad Moshiri to to Everton, and I just see him as a, a new born Evertonian that is going to push us into reaching um, the the aims and the goals and the targets that we all share between the Evertonians. Graham, the gaffer hit the nail on the head again when he said that Bill Kenwright is the perfect person to educate Mr Mashiri in the DNA of Everton Football Club. Very much so. I mean, you only have to spell, spend five minutes in Bill's company to, you know, be in, in, infectious about Everton. You know, he, he sells the club really well. He's a blue, always has been a blue. And if anybody had any doubts whatsoever in the integrity of, of what we were trying to do in bringing in the right investor, you know, that's been put to bed. How important is it, Graham, and how good is it for the football club that Bill Kenwright will still be very, very much involved? I think it's vitally important because, you know, Bill is, is Everton. Mm. You know, he's, he, he's been here a very, very long time. He knows the ins and outs. Um, you know, he's a fan, first and foremost. But uh, in Mr Mashiri, he's, he's brought in somebody to the club who's got Premier League experience as well, mm. which I think is vitally important at this level as well. So I think the future is optimistic, it's bright, the team are doing well on the pitch as well, so we're all uh, looking forward to some bright days. It's all good stuff, isn't it? And if it is the dawn of a new era for Everton, then it certainly got off to the best possible start when the players did a thoroughly professional job on Aston Villa on Tuesday night. We needed a bright start and we got one, thanks to Ramiro Funes-Mori. Yeah, I think uh, overall the team did a great job. 
uh, you know, we conceded the first goal in the uh, first minute, so uh, that built up a lot of confidence and, and got the second goal and the third goal. Kevin Morales took a beautiful corner, put it right on your head, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, I think he's, uh, he had a magnificent kick there and I just had to put my head in and, and, and it went in. So, uh, But I think the, the team offensively and defensively did a great job. We know we have uh, possession of the game and, and uh, I think uh, it was a great game. Obviously, your main job, Ramiro, is to keep them out at this end, but you must be delighted with, you, with your goal record so far in English football. Yeah, like I said, you know, for me, I have to de defend first and uh, it was unlucky that we couldn't keep the clean sheet because, you know, we were doing a great job. But uh, but like I said, uh, as a player, you know, I always have ambitions to, to score goals, to be a, in the box close uh, to, to score. So, uh, you know, it's a weapon that, that it can I would train, train and, and, and help the team with that, you know. Not just a goal tonight, but an assist as well. Tell us about that. Well, I just had to. Uh, I didn't have no angle to to shoot on the goal, so I just gave the the, the pass into the middle, and you know Romelu could uh, hit it in. Centre forwards love them, don't they? Tap ins. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, uh, like I said, overall the team did a, did a great job, and, and it builds up a lot of confidence, you know, to to come in from a week in, in Dubai, and then now, uh, you know, to 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 come in and, and win. Uh, that's very important for us. Aston Villa had their moments which you'd expect at home, but when we defended, we defended really well. Yeah, I think uh, Aston Villa, even though they're on the bottom on the on the table, uh, they are a strong team. They, they 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 will go in for every ball, and, and you know we we were we were um, uh, um, we knew that you know about the game. So uh, like I said at the start of the of the, of the game, we 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 started up uh, with a good tempo. Graham, you and I were in the commentary box at Villa Park. Phil Jagielka was your man of the match, which I agreed with, but Ramiro must have been close. Very close. I mean, it was a toss of a coin, really. I mean, you could uh, Ramiro would argue his, two, his goal and his assist probably uh, tipped it in his balance. But, uh, what does no, he I mean, need to do to get man of the match? I was going to say, no. I mean, look, I mean, the two centre-halves played very, very well. I mean, in cre credit to Aston Villa. I mean, they did, they did have a good go. I mean, they didn't throw the towel in. They had a good... I thought we were excellent for the first 15 minutes of the first half. I thought we were excellent for the second... You know, the first 15 minutes of the second half as well, where... What that can be a dangerous period, and I think we shut up shop and we we killed the game off. But Villa kept coming at us. But you know those two boys at the back defended very very well. His early goal was just about the perfect start, wasn't it? Well, it was. It was a terrific de delivery from Kevin Morales. I mean, we've got to make sure our deliveries are, are good into the box because we've got the likes of Romero who do pose a threat. Four goals so far for the Argentinian. Started really well at Everton. Well, that 3-1 success at Villa Park was a tenth away win for Everton in all competitions this season. That's some going. After the game, Roberto Martinez gave the Everton show his reaction. We knew that uh, it was a very tricky fixture, this, because from the outside you feel you, you're going away into, into the bottom team of the table and, and it doesn't work like that. We knew that Aston Villa, they... In the last six games at home, they only lost one. They had two wins and, and two draws, and, and they've been very competitive. And the start is everything. And they change their shape. It would have been all too easy to accept that the home team gets a momentum. I thought we started really bright. Uh, we control um, the way that we were going to settle in into the game, and we scored an early goal. And from that point on, we look always in a, in a good position. We had to defend at times. I thought Aston Villa brought uh, an incredible spirit and, and they pushed it uh, to the end and overall it's a victory that uh, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to underestimate how important it was to get ourselves ahead but from that point on very pleased in the manner that we managed the game and, and we were able to get a, another important three points When we had to defend, we defended very well didn't we? Yes and that's why the disappointment of, of conceding that goal is a bit of a soft moment where Brian Oviedo is, is off the pitch and he gets injured and maybe we switched off a little bit and we allowed uh, a free header in the box. So it's, it's unfortunate because it's, it's a display that he deserved a, a clean sheet and you're looking at the last six games, we've been very strong and very focused in our, in our responsibilities of the ball and as a team we work extremely, extremely hard and I thought everyone on the pitch uh, deserved to, to have that clean sheet. But then when you're capable of scoring three goals away from home and creating uh, another few good opportunities uh, is, is, is what you want is to win football games and, and to create and play well enough to, to win the game, um, whatever happens in your own, in your own goal. Damn it, as you said earlier, Aston Villa certainly had their moments at Villa Park. 
Was it a case of the game up until then had been too comfortable for Everton? Because when Villa increased their intensity, we struggled just a wee bit. I think there is a, is part of that. Yeah, I think subconsciously as a player, sometimes, when, you know, especially when you're 3-0 up, um, especially when you're as comfortable as you possibly can be, the manner in which we started the game and the comfort of that whole first half for me, um, you know, you can just take your foot off the pedal a little bit. And I think perhaps, as the gaffer just mentioned there, we just took our, took our eye off it just for a touch. And then you get that... They get that first goal and the crowd get up a little bit. All of a sudden they found their voice, started singing a little bit and it made, we had a few difficult moments. But the most important thing is that three goal cushion, you know, gave us that little bit of breathing space we needed. Had Villa scored a goal when it was only 2-0, it could have been a different outcome. Of course, we say it all the time, don't we? 2-0 is a precarious scoreline. You know, they get the goal, game on. We get that third goal, pretty much game over. That's how it panned out. 10 away wins this season. It's a fantastic record, isn't it? And that's it for part one of this week's Everton show. Don't drift too far away from your telly, though, because after a short break, we'll once again get under the skin of the football club and take you behind the scenes. Welcome back to part two of this week's Everton show. Now, the family of a music-loving Evertonian will see his dream come true on Saturday when one of his own songs will be played at Goodison Park. Peter Fiddler passed away on New Year's Eve at the age of just 18 after a three-year battle with cancer. And now his parents, David and Kath, are bringing together his two passions, music and Everton Football Club, to raise money for the Teenage Cancer Trust. A song that Peter wrote will be played during half-time at Saturday's game, with fans urged to show their support by making a donation to the cancer charity that helped him during his period of treatment. Here is Peter's inspiring and emotional story, as told by his father, Dave. Peter, happy lad. Um, wakes up in the morning, happy, goes to bed, happy, always has been a happy lad. He yeah, started suffering a little bit of pain. Um, initially we thought, yeah, it's sciatica. He was diagnosed on sciatica, so it was a case of rest. Unfortunately, after, after a period um, where people were suffering quite a bit, it was then diagnosed that he had cancer. That was when he was 15, he was diagnosed with cancer, and he lost Peter on New Year's Eve this year. So you're talking about a three-year period, which would initially make you think, that must have been an awful three years. But it wasn't, we had a good three years. We, we, we had quite a good time. Over them three years, he missed four games here. Which is amazing. Out of all the, all the treatments he had, he missed four games. Everton will do whatever he can to make sure you get to see the game. If you can get here, they'll, they'll accommodate you. The Teenage Cancer Trust, they have dealt enormously. When they're looking after you, you don't know that the Teenage Cancer Trust are looking after you. They, what they do is very much in the background, if you like, but just ensure and keep an eye on you that you're okay. Yeah, very much looked after Peter, and we're able to give him little boosts every now and then. We got to meet Noel Gallagher, um, which was great. Got to see a few concerts up and down the country, and through that, Peter's love of music grew to an extent that he, he started his own band. Like his first gig, he, he donated all, all his takings from his first gig to the Teenage Cancer Trust. It was, it was great. This was great. Leighton Baines came round to Pete's house and, and sat down and had a cup of tea, just, just as if he was your mate. He was, Leighton Baines was just an absolute superstar. Um, and then from that, we, we came here, met, met a few more of the players. And we've been up to Finch Farm as well. Everyone at Everton, they're, they're, just, they're just an amazing club. But you never told me, oh no, Everton's an amazing club. If, if he could have performed, if he had a choice of stadiums to perform at, he'd have been here. He'd, and the, the idea that he's going to um, be performing in front of 30 or 1,000, um, he'd, be, he'd be laughing, he'd be laughing, he'd be having a blast. He, for, for Peter, definitely, for his mum, definitely, and for me, it'd be great. It, it's tough, it's tough. A hundred teenagers every year across Merseyside, North Wales, will be diagnosed with cancer. Any monies that we can raise that, that helps with that. It would be there for, for Pete. It would be down to Pete helping out those who helped him out. In, in effect, he is still with us, so he'll enjoy the day. But um, it would mean a lot to him to, to be here. And again, it wouldn't have happened. Without Everton, without Teenage Cancer Trust, it wouldn't have happened. Without Pete. <laughs>
Graham, another astonishing piece of film. What a brave man Dave Fiddler is, Peter's father. And I'm sure the Everton supporters will embrace the playing of the song on Saturday and will donate to the Teenage Cancer Trust. It's the power of football again. Yeah, the power of football, the power of Everton Football Club and every power to, to Peter as well for, for his battle against cancer. It's a terrible disease that affects so many people, but uh, I'm sure when the, when the song comes on at half-time, it's going to be an incredibly moving moment for Dave and Kath. It's difficult at times, but as, as Dave himself said, the Everton Football Club have been terrific, and I'm not blowing our own trumpet, but yourself and Sharpie and Snods are just humble to be able to help out in any small way. Well, we are, because um, we're very fortunate that, we, you know, one, we've got our health, mm. and we go and see these, these kids, and, you know, it, it's very it's difficult at times, you know, because, you know, that, that they are suffering, and it, it's, it, they're at such a young age, they've not, not really had the chance to live their, their lives, and... You know, if we as a football club can make their last few years, you know, fruitful, that's all we can do. And we try and do our very best by them. It is an inspirational story and Dave Fiddler is a very, very brave man. Well, regular Goodison Park attendees this season will doubtless have enjoyed watching our Snods v Diamond challenges that we show in the fan zone before the games. We've set the pair of them a series of games and sports to see who comes out on top. And recently I went with them to Old Trafford for their latest matchup. Not the theatre of dreams as graced by George Best, Bobby Charlton and Eric Jemba Jemba, by the way, but the home of Lancashire Cricket Club. I've seen him bat, I've seen him bowl. No pressure on me whatsoever. I'm just, uh, you know, honoured to be here next to him because he's a Yorkshireman <laughs> and by all accounts that qualifies you to be the best cricketer in the country. <laughs> Good luck, Graham. Well, the best nods. Thank you. Have you got my 20p? <laughs> Gone. Gone. That's in Huddersfield. Oh, it's a wide. Four. No, I think that's cool. Four. No, yeah. No, 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 Four. Ian. Runs off the leg side, four. Up in the air, out. Ah. That's out as well. Good shot, Ian. Thank you, flex that. I'd have stopped it in the game. <laughs> Give you one to mid Two. off. Two. Two. Mid off, oh, mid ons there. <laughs> oh, that's gone for four. Two off the last ball snods. Ooh. Oh, stringy! Great ball. Oh, nearly the ideal start snods. Oh. It's good delivery though. Yorkshire, Yorkshire, Yorkshire. Oh, Ian, very good. Liking that. <laughs> He's chucked the Yorker in early doors. Never been a ball that. Straight in the stumps in the block hole. It's the perfect it's delivery. It's the perfect delivery, Ian. Oh, that's better. Two to cause the biggest shock in cricket history. Oh, dearie me! Dear me! Oh. I thought the blue stump was going. <laughs> <laughs> Never been bowling that. Sorry, oh, it's the shock of cricket in history. How were miles back a batsman? How? Uh, how many times you get me out? Yeah, None. That don't make any difference. I've clean bowled you. Yeah, go on. I've taken two wickets. Where you took two wickets? Two wickets there in the bowl. How off. are Miles better batsman than you? How? Get pads back on. Not as much snods v Diamond as Surrey v Yorkshire, so we had to go to a neutral venue, Lancashire Cricket Club, who looked after us very, very well, by the way, and an upset. It was an upset, yeah. As I said before, he's a Yorkshireman. He talks a great game of cricket, snods. He's very passionate about his cricket. Mm. He loves it, actually, to be fair. And he's a, he's a decent batsman, Snods. He, he surprised me a little bit, but uh, there was only really one way we could have a competition, and that was to bowl at the stumps. And I've just done him a little bit on the last delivery there. So it was... I'm not so sure... I, I think I sort of shocked him a little bit. I didn't mm. think a little uh, southern softy like me 
thought we could deal with a Yorkshireman, but we nearly had to get the boxing gloves out <laughs> afterwards. I tell you, he lost it. He didn't take it very well, did he? As a Yorkshireman, he wouldn't do. No, he wouldn't do. But uh, by all accounts, he's been on to Martin Moxon up at Yorkshire <laughs> and he wants a rematch <laughs> on his home turf. So uh, I'll look forward to that. Absolutely. That'll be another Snods v Diamond challenge. Well, later this month, the Women's Super League will kick off. Everton ladies, of course, will be aiming for promotion back to the top flight. And if their FA Cup form is anything to go by, they're certainly in with a shout. Already, the girls have reached the last 16 of the competition after last weekend putting five goals past Nottingham Forest in the fourth round. We obviously had to wait and be patient. And as I say, um, once those first two goals come I always felt obviously we'd go on to win but the key thing was that we went on to win with a better performance and obviously added to the goals of the first half so I was pleased with um, you know the, the goals that we scored in the second half. Good win to get into the next round the performance wasn't where we wanted it to be to be fair at half time we sort of addressed that come out second half and thought we were a lot better but going into the, the league season we do need to perform a lot better. The clean sheets are always going to be important because they'll always define the better teams the number of clean sheets that you can get and, and so so yes, um, you know, seeing another clean sheet, yet another, you know, five goals added to the seven of the previous round is means that you know we're showing we can score and we're, and we're not wanting to give goals away, which is going to be really important come the WSL and and obviously the next round of the cup. As I said there, Diamond, in the intro to that uh, piece of film, the ladies are on fire in the FA Cup, aren't they? They're doing really well. I mean, we had Andy on last week and he was saying that he was impressed with the standard of the, of the, of the girls and the way they're playing and their technique and what have you. Clearly, their goal-scoring ability is not too shabby either. So um, they followed up the, the previous round's uh, good result at Stoke mm. with a terrific victory 5-0 at Nottingham Forest. There's nothing like good PR for the ladies' game and there's nothing like good PR than an FA Cup run. Yeah, similar to the first team, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the girls take it every bit as seriously as, as the fans do and the first team do. So uh, good luck to them. Hopefully they can go all the way and, and that would be a lovely double, wouldn't it? The, the, the first team and, and the girls going to FA Cup glory. It would be terrific for the club. Wouldn't it just? We don't like to get too far ahead of ourselves, but the FA Cup quarterfinal is looming, isn't it? And it's got to be on people's minds. It will be because it, it's a huge game. Uh, we've obviously got a, a big game before that against West Ham as well. Um, we've got to make sure that we do it at first team level and the girls will look forward to their game as well and, and hopefully they'll progress. The Gafford will be saying to the players this week, won't he, just take it one game at a time. I don't want any mention of Chelsea or the FA Cup until Monday. No, you don't want to be getting ahead of yourself, do you? And obviously, especially with the result midweek as well, with West Ham gaining another three points. Um, the results didn't really go for us, did they? No, so no. It, it's paramount we pick up three points on Saturday because if we've got any thoughts whatsoever of European football next season, we have to start making inroads. Big games every single week now, isn't it, between now and the end of the season. Now we've reached the halfway point in this week's Everton show. Part three is traditionally our big interview segment, and this week we speak to a former midfield player forever associated with a pileon during the Merseyside derby. Don't miss Lee Carsley. <laughs> Welcome back to part three of this week's Everton show and it's time now for our big interview. Our guest in the hot seat, it's actually the chairman's office inside Goodison Park. This week is Lee Carsley, the former Republic of Ireland midfielder played 198 times for Everton after joining us in 2002 from Coventry City. Undoubtedly, the most memorable of his 13 goals for the Toffees within 2004 against Liverpool. Enjoy this week's big interview with Lee Carsley. Lee, always great to see you back at Goodison Park. You're always guaranteed a warm welcome when you come back here, which is nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the game today. It's been um, my first game of the season that I've been back for, so obviously I've been watching a lot of the games um, at home and doing a few of the Sky games as well. So it's been uh, it's been an interesting season. Still look out for our results, don't you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean it's definitely my still still mine and my family's club, so it's um, it's club close to my heart. What do you recall of actually joining Everton? How did that come about? Can you remember? Well, I think we were um, we were in a, um, a funny position. Coventry had just been relegated. Um, there was there was two or three occasions in my career before joining Everton where I had the chance to uh, to join, and it just didn't quite happen. And then um, Coventry getting relegated and, and needing the money, and obviously um, Everton needing um, a defensive midfielder. Um, it was a it was a good match. Um, it was maybe maybe four or five years in the making, and then finally um, the, the move come about. Good football man, Walter, wasn't he? He was, yeah. It was. Um, it was unfortunate that the, I think um, I only maybe played two or three games under him, 
um, before he went, and I think there was a, maybe a lot more going on off the pitch than than um, than, than people knew about. So um, you know, uh, both both uh, Walter and uh, Michael Dunford, who, who I was with at, um, at Derby beforehand, uh, both good uh, football people that um, you know I'm proud to have met. Them. When David Moyes took over, we were staring into the abyss a little bit. We were in trouble, weren't we? No two ways about it. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, you know, from a, from a personal point of view, I was unsure about whether I'd. I'd done the right thing um, with the move. Um, I'd signed on on loan um, to rush the, the transfer through. So, you know, I, I had one or two conversations with Coventry with regards going back and and maybe really? maybe yeah, not not pushing it through because I just wasn't sure how it was going to go. I needed I, I was at a time where I needed some stability as well in my career with the with the the World Cup on the horizon as well. Um, it was important that. Um, you know, I, I was playing and I was you know doing well, and obviously a new manager coming in and shuffling the squad around, and I, I, I think I started the first four or five games playing right wing, which obviously, <laughs> you know, I think That's I was how desperate. We I, were. Was, I was right wing, and Nunzi was left wing, and <laughs> so yeah, there weren't a lot of attacking. But you know, it was it was a it was a, obviously a, a decision that um, you know, turned out to be a great one. One question I like to ask the experienced players that were at Heaven at the time is: When did you first become aware that there was a young boy called Wayne Rooney very quickly making his way through the academy ranks? I think it was maybe after um, three or four months. I used to spend a lot of time at um, Belfield in the afternoons. Um, myself, um, uh, Tim Cale, uh, Kev Kilban, people like this, we played tennis, and uh, it was at a time when um, we were on the same um, training ground so you, we'd get the, the, the school boys as they were then and the academy had every now and then would come in and you know talking to the likes of uh, Neil Dewsnip he'd, um, he'd say you need to need to have a look at this this lad here he's a bit special and it weren't long before then that Wayne was training with the, with the first team so um, it, was, uh, it was good to be part of that and obviously seeing the way he's progressed and the way he's matured and and obviously, obviously, what he's doing now—it's um, you know, it was—it was good to be part of that. And again, the ex-players who I speak to, nobody's surprised that that young boy is breaking all sorts of records for club and country. Definitely, yeah. I think uh, I, remember, I remember being on the uh, on the coach. We were on our way to Man United and um, to play in a midweek game, and um, Wayne was sat at the back behind me and Kev and Kev, Kev Campbell. Kev, he said uh, he'll beat Man United one day, and I was like, I didn't see that. I couldn't see. I know I, I couldn't see him leaving Everton, knowing that you know I drove past his house. At, um, thousand times, and you'd see the the Everton stuff in his in his bedroom window. So I couldn't see him ever leaving, and I'm sure at some point he'll be back. Um, but the what the way he's what he's done for Man United and uh, England is is testament to to himself and his family. You said there that you'd stay behind of an afternoon and watch the the young players going through their paces. Yeah. Was it round about then that you thought about coaching as a as a post playing option? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I always um, knew that when I retired that I wanted to go down the coaching route, something that I was always interested in, uh, the development side of it especially, um, spending a lot of time in the afternoons as well with Andy Holden and the uh, under 21s um, as it was then, um, seeing him develop the you know, the likes of um, Hibbo and Ozzy and Chaddy and um, the, the amount of players that were coming through, um, it was it was, um, it was was good to see how um, how much strength and depth that they had and it's on Unusual now. Now I now I I, I, um, I see a lot of academies how strong the Everton youth teams are and and the players that they've got in the system. There's there's definitely um, something different about um, players from Merseyside. What are you up to these days, Lee? I'm um, assisting Andy Boothroyd with the England under 19. So um, quite a um, it's a it's part time role which gives me plenty of time during the week to go around different clubs and see uh, different styles of coaching, um, different games at all levels, 18s, 21s. Um, Looking the fact that we've got uh, Ryan Ledson, John Joe, uh, Kenny, uh, Callum Connolly, so we've got some good lads from um, Everton uh, in the system, and it's good to see how they're progressing and um, keeping an eye on them. Just on the international scene, it's terrific for the Euros that the Irish will be there because, as you know only too well, they do enjoy themselves. Definitely, yeah. I think uh, you know it's the, the Irish fans are renowned for travelling in, in thousands and and taking over stadiums wherever they go out throughout the world. I remember the. Um, in 2002, in in South Korea, you know there was there was thousands and thousands of, of <laughs> Irish there. fans. Yeah, even there. <laughs> so, you know the fact that it's uh, in Europe will will, will um, you know won't won't mean any different. There'll be there'll be thousands travelling throughout. Do you think Seamus and James McCarthy will be certain starters? Um, I hope so. Yeah, if they keep fit, I would I would imagine so. I mean, James has, uh, has struggled with his with his fitness with uh, the Republic of Ireland, but. Um, Any time that um, a player like that's fit and available, he's he's got to play. Um, I've been really impressed with uh, James McCarthy, as I have with Seamus as well. 
they're both um, both top players. Some story that isn't it, Seamus Coleman, young lad from Killy Beggs playing for Sligo, yeah. and then next minute he's representing his country yeah, on was, just about the biggest stage yeah, of the lot. Definitely, yeah. I mean, it was um, he's he's had some he's had some journey. I was um, I was at Birmingham at the time, um, just before I retired, when Seamus come for a week's trial, um, and he was one of the best trialists that I'd ever seen. And I couldn't believe that Birmingham didn't sign him. And uh, a few weeks later, I got a phone call off David Moyes saying, did you see much of this lad? I was like, yeah, he's a good player. And obviously, Everton had signed him. So it's, um, it weren't much of a gamble, that one. He's got a bit of everything, hasn't he? He has, yeah, he has. Um, he's uh, obviously, he's, he's um, probably better known for his attacking, his attacking play. I think it, um, you know, if he, can, if he can just tighten up that defensive side of his game, um, I think it helps as well with whoever plays in front of him. I've noticed the last couple of games that Aaron Lennon's played there, who's a, um, a typical British kind of winger that, that works hard and works up and down. I think they, he, um, they, they've got a nice partnership at the minute. Everton just seems to be edging in the right direction now, don't they? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's been a, a frustrating kind of season when you, when, you, um, when you look at the state, not once at the state of the Premier League, but the way that the condition that the Premier League's in at the minute, where it's almost like anyone could... Given that run of form, you look at Leicester the way the way that they've just ground out, being consistent all season. Uh, when you consider the amount of points that we've dropped um, late, in later stage of the game when we're when we're winning, you know that's a frustrating bit. Just finally, you're still in touch with a few people from down at Finch Farm. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm seeing um, I'm, I'm, I'm with Tony today, Tony Sage down um, down in the um, we're having a bit of dinner together. Obviously, um, I, I, I've tried to. Um, Step away from Jimmy Martin, but he keeps he keeps ringing and texting me, so that's that's unfortunate. But you can't have it all, can you? Um, but now I try and keep in, in touch with as many of the lads as I can. He was a great lad to work with at Everton Lee Carsley, and he's still a smashing guy, isn't he? He is. I've met Cars a few times, to be honest with you, and I, he he comes across as a guy I'd have loved to have been in my mm. dressing room. You need players like him, don't you? Players who are not afraid to do the dirty job, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, you need a, a fine balance in your side, don't you? I mean, you, you, you need your goal scorers, you need your, your creators. But certainly, Cars was somebody you could you know, hang your hat on mm. as being that man in midfield who would, who would win the ball, give it si um, simply. You know, and, he, and he pitched in with a few goals as well. And something I'll always be jealous of, somebody who <laughs> scored against the Reds. You came close, though, didn't you? Remember you hit the bar from about half a mile out, didn't you? At, yeah, at that was unfortunate. Yeah, at Anfield, cut in from the left and bent one and it hit the sort of cross, you know, the crossbar on the post. But, uh, you know, Cars has got that one on me. Mm. You played with a few Lee Carsley type players, though, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I mean, springs to mind. I mean, we talk about the dogs of war and I think Cars would have certainly fitted into that. Um, you know, Joe Parkinson, John Eberle, Barry Horn, those kind of players. You know, I think Lee was of a similar ilk. Um, talented as well, but you never, never ever, ever forget how good these players are. It's not just the fact that they get about the pitch and they, they tackle and, and then they do the simple things. You know, that in itself is a skill to mm -hmm. recognise, to, to, to do things simply once you've won the ball back. The technical ability can often be overlooked in players like that, but at the end of the day, these boys are professional footballers playing at the top level, the best league in Europe. That's right, and he played 198 games for us and numerous for numerous more games for other clubs as well. So, you know, he was always fit, you know, he was he was strong, he was robust. I mean, he knew the game inside out, and, and as the years went by, he used his experience very well. He was as good off the pitch as he was on it. He was terrific in the dressing room, he was terrific with all the staff. You can't operate without players like that. You can't. I mean, you need good characters, and I think that's a trait at Everton Football Club. We want good characters. It's all great, you know, all well and good having good players. You want good characters, strong people in your dressing room to, to drag people through, and when the chips are down, you know, have, have you got the strength in depth to come through? And, uh, you know, certainly Lee was a popular character. You speak very highly of him, Darren. That's where the likes of Leon Osman, Tony Hibbert and going back, your Phil Nevilles, your James Beatties, they're worth the weight in gold, aren't they? Well, of course they are. And you, you, as I say, I keep talk, talking about characters, but that's what your clubs are built on. That's what good sides are built on, good characters and, and added to that the, the, the potential and, and the ability that these players have. And I'm sure that's what Roberto's looking to build, you know, and, and strengthen, you know, every, every single year that uh, moves on at this football club. And what are the character end of the season, aren't we? The business end of the season when you need your characters because we'd take 11-1-0 wins now, wouldn't we? Well, of course we would. And I mean, Cars was part of a side that were regularly winning 1-0 under mm -hmm. David Moyes as well. So, you know, clearly he knew his job inside out. But, um, you know, it, it's got to that point of the season now where, you know, you, you've got to have character as much as anything else. And, you know, all of a sudden your games are becoming difficult whether up the top or down the bottom. Teams are going for championships, European places, and they're trying to avoid relegation as well. 
Plenty of twists and turns left in this Premier League season, that's for sure. And that's us done for part three of this week's programme. After a few adverts, we'll return with the final segment when we start to look ahead to the weekend visit of West Ham United. We'll also hear from a very contented Mo Bezic. We're into the fourth and final section of this week's show now, and amongst all the good news of the last ten days or so was the confirmation that Mo Bezic has extended his contract at Everton Football Club. The Bosnian is as popular in the dressing room as he is with the fans and he's delighted to have put pen to paper. Yeah, I'm really happy that I signed a five uh, years contract with a uh, club uh, like Everton. So, I mean, it's now after one and a half season, it makes me proud that Everton gave me a new contract. So, yeah. And what have you enjoyed the most so far, Mo, about being an Everton player? Yeah, like I said, always it was difficult on the beginning and uh, now I feel home. Yeah, and I think the support that make me, like, uh, makes me feel welcome here in the club and uh, I feel really, really happy here. Yeah, certainly one of the... You've become a fan favourite here at Everton, haven't you? The fans love you. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think. <laughs> was, it, was it an easy deal to sort out then, Mo? Was it, was it straightforward? You wanted to stay, the club wanted you to stay? Yeah, it was very easy when I heard from it. It, it was uh, clear that I would stay here and sign a new contract. Like I said, I'm really happy to do that. And, and how do you feel you've improved as a player Mo, over the last year and a half? Yeah, I think um, when the people look now in my game before and now, I think I improved a lot in, in a lot of things. And um, But still, still like you see, I had three injuries, so still I adapt to the league. And um, yeah, I will work and give my, give my best. Obviously, the fact your contract is for another five years, you must see there's so much potential here with, with the squad and, and what the manager is building. Yeah, I mean, uh, we always say, uh, we always speak about uh, things we want to go in Europe or something. So, I mean, um, I will not say nothing now. I will just show it on the pitch and I hope that we will do. Also, in the next uh, 12 games, I think, with uh, the Chelsea game also in the FA Cup, I hope that we will, we will um, say, like, speak now on the pitch. That's a massive show of trust from the manager in Mo Bezic, isn't it? A five and a half year deal, but the boy deserves it. I think he does. I, it, I mean, in all honesty, it's been a little bit stop start for Mo, but the bits that we've seen where he's had a, a run of games together, you know, he gives us an energy. Um, he's, got a, he's feisty, he's got that mm. fire in his belly that, that I like. And what I'm really impressed with out of everything is the way he spoke there. You know, he's, he's not talking the talk, he wants to walk the walk. You know, he's saying, look, you know, it's all well and good talking about this potential and this, that and the other. I'm going to do it on the pitch. I like to hear that. His most recent injury is probably his most frustrating because this picture was taken at the Player of the Month ceremony. If you're winning the Player of the Month, you're doing something right. And he was just starting to show the Evertonians the real Mo Bezic. Yeah, we, we were getting to see that. I mean, he's, I think there's an awful lot to come from him. You know, he, people talk about where, where's his best position. You know, is he a holding midfield player? But I think he can get us goals as well. He's got such energy. He can get up and down the pitch. He can be an all-round midfield player, that man. He's a really nice guy as well, is Mo Bezic. Right, let's start the countdown now to Saturday's Premier League visit of West Ham United. The Hammers, of course, are on the cusp of a European qualification slot after a fine win against Tottenham Hotspur on Wednesday night. But we're in pretty good nick too. And it's a game that inform Aaron Lennon is looking forward to. Yeah, they've been playing well. They've been going well all season, really. Um, they picked up a great result yesterday against Spurs, and they'll be coming to play us on the weekend with um, with big confidence. But we're playing well as well, and um, we know on our day we we can beat anyone. I'm sure we've been assessing them all week. Uh, what have we? What do you guys have been working on? And what what uh, what strengths do they have? Um, we know that's sort of team. We aren't really. We'd probably do a lot of work tomorrow because obviously we're just coming in the back end of um, Tuesday's game, but. Um, we worked, we played them before, we know they're a strong side. Um, they play a lot of counter-attacking football, especially away from home. Um, they've got powerful players and they've got great individuals, So, um, but we'll be ready for them. Really hard-working side as well, real togetherness at West Ham. Yeah, you can see that, you can see their managers installed that. Um, I know a few of the boys down there, um, Noble, the skipper and stuff, and they demand that and they always have done at West Ham, to be honest. And um, Like I said, they've got a lot of togetherness, you can see that, and um, we'll have to be at 100% to, to beat them. I mean, you personally should be uh, full of confidence at the moment, but you're on a real purple patch in front of goal at the moment. Yeah, um, it's going really well for me. Um, everything I seem to hit seems to be going in at the minute, um, which is great for me, great for the team also. But like I said, a lot of my chances are coming from other players providing them. So um, if it weren't for them, I won't be scoring the goals. Is it the style of play that we have that lends itself for the wingers scoring goals? It's not just Rom, is it? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I think the manager gives uh, the wide players that freedom. Um, he's always telling me, if the ball's on the other side, you have to get in the box. I want you in the box scoring goals. And um, like I say, when the manager gives you that license and freedom to do that, um, if you end up in the box, you're going to get chances. Enjoying your football then? Yeah, loving it. Um, like I said, it's, it's been going great for me. Um, I've enjoyed the whole season to fair, even when I weren't playing. Um, buzzing, buzzing to be back here, I've said it before, but um, literally enjoyed every minute of it. Some really good performances uh, in February as well, team uh, and yourself personally. Yeah, of course. I think we've been on, um, on a great run of form. I think we had a little blip at West Brom, which we should have deservedly won the game actually. But um, other than that, we've been on a really good patch and we're looking to continue that to the end of the season now. Graham, as Aaron Lennon said there, he's really enjoying his football and you, me and all the Evertonians are enjoying watching him at the moment. We are. He's been terrific, but very consistent on the ball but every bit is consistent off the ball as well. He's a proper Everton player. He can finish the boy, can't he? He can, like he said in his interview there, the gaffer's saying to him, look, you know, you don't score goals stuck out on the opposite side of the pitch. Get yourself in the, bo in the box, perfect example. Second goal against Aston Villa, Kevin Morales not, cuts it back. Mm. Aaron Lennon's virtually on the penalty spot, putting it in the back of the net. West Ham United at Goodison Park on Saturday. Are you looking forward to seeing your old pal, Big Slav? Yeah, I am actually. He's doing really well. Every credit mm. to Slav. He's, he's turned West Ham totally around as a... a, a certain sense of positivity down there at Upton Park. Uh, I'm not so sure they've been quite so good on their travels and hopefully they won't be Saturday, but uh, it's got all the makings of a really good game now because as you said there, Daz, before, that you know they're going to be looking at the Champions League spots now. Why not? They're in a decent position and they're in a great form. It doesn't happen to you very often, uh, if, especially over the, over the past few years at West Ham United. You know They've never been in that position, so why not give it the best possible shout? It's up to us to really get into them Saturday, make sure the atmosphere is good. We're giving the crowd something to, to shout about, because if we play to the top of our level, then we can win this game. And this fellow, Aaron Lennon, will doubtless be key once again. Well, the visit of West Ham, of course, means a return to Goodison Park for Slavon Bilic. He's done a great job at Upton Park, and his opposite number on Saturday, Roberto Martinez, insists that Everton's home form has got to improve if we're to take anything from the game. Obviously, it's, a, it's an area that we all feel that we have to correct. I think this season, the results that we had at Goodison, they haven't been uh, um, what we expected at times. Um, they haven't been reflected what we deserve on the pitch. Um, others uh, is that we've been very, very unfortunate. Um, I think now is just the opportunity to try to uh, reverse that and, and having a really strong ending at Goodison. We want to give good performances to our fans, which we always share that commitment and, and that good football and that attacking purpose. But we have to win football games, and that's the truth. Uh, it would be great to, to be able to share that responsibility between us and with the fans and, and understand that we need their help and, and see how far we can go with the, the amount of points that we got left to, to play for our goodies. And our away uh, form has been, it's been very impressive, probably the best away form that we had uh, in the Premier League for a long time. And it's, 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 it's a real shame that we haven't been able to get enough points with our home performances and our fans deserve better. And it's been an exciting fixture of the last couple of years, always open, attractive matches. It is. I think even the, the game that we played early on in the season, you could see that this is a side that they got a really good balance, a side that they, they defend uh, aggressively and really, really well. But then they got individuals that they can produce a piece of, of, uh, of good play out of nothing. And it, it will be a, a tight game, but we need to just concentrate on, on what's going to be a really significant week. For, uh, for the for the uh, for the outcome of of this this Premier League season, your old mate Slaven Bilic has impressed you this season, Graham. Which West Ham players have caught your eye? I think they've got a good goalkeeper in Adrian. Um, Winston Reid's played very well. Cresswell's a good player, uh, but you have you know you always look at the top half of the pitch. I do anyway. And Antonio and and Payet, they've been very very good. Scored Antonio scored plenty of goals. Payet's a creator. So we're going to have to be on our, uh, our metal on Saturday, that's for sure. And West Ham this season have got the, the, the motivation and the inspiration, if you like, of, of the last ever season at Upton Park. I wonder if that's affecting them a little bit, pushing yeah. them on a bit. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm sure Slav's mentioned that and, uh, listen, let's go out on a high. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all about us for me. You know, forget West Ham. Let's talk about Everton. And, you know, if we go out there and we're positive and, and, and we can get the crowd, you know, and the atmosphere up, you know, we can give anybody a tough time and that includes West Ham. The manager's alluded in his, in his 
message there about the new investor that it is the dawn of a new era. We do need to start winning more home games, don't we? Well, of course we do. Yeah, it's been disappointing. I mean, I think if we will look back over the course of the season and be disappointed at our, our points tally from home games, and it's you know it can it can sway a lot of people's judgments as well. Your home form, because obviously that's what every you know the majority of the fans get to the home games. But it's a shame that we can't you know we haven't played like we have away at home. But uh, you know it's something we've got to work on. Something we've got to turn around. If things aren't going well, it can be a difficult place to play Goodison Park. There's a, there's a demand and it's something that the players have got to get used to. It's never going to go away and they'll get better from it from the, the experience of this season, that's for sure. I'm sure the atmosphere against West Ham will be fantastic on Saturday. And that wraps up another Everton show. As we've stressed this week, it's a wonderful time to be an Evertonian. But as the chairman always says to me, son, it's always a wonderful time to be an Evertonian. And he's right, of course. My thanks to Graeme Stewart for his terrific input this week. I've enjoyed it immensely. I'm sure you have too. Do join us again next week for another Everton show. <laughs>